really appreciate you joining us this evening, Nina. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. So, um, special guest, um, a bit, a bit like uh, one of my other kind of player guests the other week. I've actually known Nina for, oh, wow, what, what are we in now? So you're 93 born, 13. So since you were an under 14, uh, our teams yeah. often were in the same league um, for a number of years, for about four years. Um, Nina's team, um, uh, Southend Swifts, is that right? Yeah, correct. Um, they just terrorised us. Uh, you know, we used to have some great battles um, with you with you guys, with Haringey as well. That was a, another really tough team at the time. Um, and, yeah, just for a number of years, between Nina and Steve Pearl, they just made my basketball life a living hell. But kept me on my toes, <laughs> kept us kept us competitive and yeah, just some great battles over the years. Um and then eventually I met Nina um in the in a kind of coach player capacity at the when I think Nina you were doing England under eighteens and we went to European Championships um in Hungary and yeah, that was a crazy um kind of few months that in the preparation and then eventually the tournament which didn't go quite as planned and I'm sure you might elaborate on that a little bit as we get through the show. So as we do every week, um, I like the, I like the guests just to give us a, a summary of, of kind of their basketball journey. Um, you know, tell us where did it, where did it begin for you? Where did you get to? Where did you, where are you now? And, and what are your thoughts? So I started playing basketball, I guess, relatively late when you compare to um, a lot of other professional athletes. Um, but I was very grateful that my brother introduced me to the game. At the time, he was probably pushing 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Um, so we used to play on the driveway um, outside my house. We'd play at the park whenever we could, really. Um, and I guess from there, I started playing at secondary school and then very quickly enjoyed the game so much so looked to join a club that's where I found South End Swifts and from there I was in the gym as much as I possibly could I would go before school we'd actually have to break into the gym to be able to get access to the sports hall which um, I wrote about recently in a blog and I had my head teacher reply on Facebook which I, I didn't even realize I had him on Facebook and I was still nervous as a 27 year old girl to say oh like I'm sorry sir like I didn't <laughs> I didn't realize you were going to read this but yeah, so we used to, to, to have to break into the sports hall in the morning to be able to, to get extra workouts in. And, and then I was, I was playing club basketball and, and sort of, I was terrible to begin with. I'm going to be really honest. I was, other than my height, I'm not sure like what I had going for me, um, but I worked hard. I, I really enjoyed it. And so that was my main focus at the beginning. And as a 14 year old, I managed to progress enough to, to make the under 16 national team. That was my first experience playing in a European competition and with Karen Burton at the time, who must still speak to this day. And I'm, I'm very grateful for her relationship and uh, her um, friendship. And, and then I guess I moved through the junior ranks. Um, we were undefeated at the school level and uh, we were very, like you mentioned, we were very competitive at the club level. I played as a youth, I would sometimes play three or four games in a weekend playing for all the different senior teams at the club. Um, and then I think around sort of 15, 16, um, it became on my radar that I wanted to, to go to America. And although it was an, as popular as an option or as common as an option as it is nowadays it was something that I really wanted to do I spent a lot of time as a youth growing up in America and so it's it's somewhere that I felt like was home and coupled with that it was the best place at the time for me to go and progress my basketball career but also have the opportunity to continue my academic studies and so I went then went to Barkin Abbey played in the WBBL which is the highest level um, in this country and um, which allowed me to have the exposure coupled with national team during the summer to receive um sort of 15 to 20 different scholarship offers to america and that was a, a really overwhelming experience i think it was the first time in my life that i was recruited for something um a lot of the time before then i had to prove myself whether it was national team or regional tournaments or 
county tournaments, it was always me trying to impress my skills or mindset or capabilities on the coach to hopefully be selected. And this was a complete shift where you're actually now being recruited and, and they're trying to convince you as to why you should continue your basketball journey um, and academic studies with them. And so it was a very difficult decision for me, but I decided to to go to a school called Fordham University, which is in New York City. Um, and up until that point, I haven't lived in a, in a city. I'm not from London. I'm from Essex, so it's quite like suburban. So that was a massive, another massive change for me. It was very overwhelming when I first got there, but um, a challenge that I'd welcomed and that I'd planned for. And then um, I had a few stints with the senior national team camps, but I never actually have been selected to, to play for the senior team. And um, beyond that, then I returned to the UK. I didn't think I was going to play basketball anymore. Um, I re I've probably retired two or three times so far <laughs> in my um, <laughs> relatively short career, um, which now is a bit of a running joke among uh, my family and friends. But started working and then realized that I missed basketball. And so tried to, to get back into the game and tried to make it work um, playing and also working at the same time, which I know a lot of people in this country are able to do and it, and it always really impresses me just because I realized very quickly how difficult that would be to be competitive on the court, but also to be successful in, in your everyday job. Um, so after a while, I realized, you know what, I don't think I'm fully finished playing basketball. I think I still, I still have too much love for the game to, to put it to one side. And so and fast forward a little bit to present, I'm currently studying for my master's. I do marketing consulting um, on the side. And um, I also play for the riders, which that we play in the WBBL, as I'm sure you know. And um, last season, we won the, the trophy. I would like to say that we could have had um, a chance of beating Seven Oaks and gone all the way. But obviously, it's easy to say that when um, that was taken off the table with coronavirus. So we're very excited for the upcoming season and hopefully, you know, with the team that we're, we're putting together, I think that we're, we're going to be really competitive and everyone's going to have that added enthusiasm just because we've had what feels like a never ending off season. So yeah. that's sort of the, the brief summary of my experiences. Yeah. Well, look, that, that is a, an incredibly um, brief summary because actually you know, you and I were talking before the show about, you know, some of the detail of that experience, that those experiences. And, um, you know, I, I started off by saying that, you know, we we met each other in, uh, I want to say it was around 2011 at Europeans. Uh, that, that might not be the exact date, but, you know, we were in Hungary for a, at least a month because I think we went out there for a, a, at least a, a week and a half. With training camps or with with Michael Ball and, and Lee Ryan, um, a great a great group of athletes. Maisie was there as well, so you were playing with one of your friends as well. Um, right. And yeah, it started that, that that tournament started off with a lot of kind of excitement, a lot of kind of hopefulness of of where that that England team could finish. Um, but unfortunately, it started it it started not so well for you because you were dealing with, you know, a, a knee injury, which I'm not sure which of your two ACL injuries that mm. that was a part of, because, you know, you've, you've had, you've, you've had injuries and you've, you've fought through those and, and come through. So can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what it, what it took for you to kind of come back through two ACLs? Because that's not, that's not a normal kind of story for someone who's still very much involved in playing basketball. For some people, that is effectively the end of their career. Not always by not always by design. You know, not not always out. You no, know, because they you know they can't they can't get back. But just because it is tough, it's a tough road back. So could you just talk a little bit about getting through those those injuries? Yeah, I think that when my when I first tore my ACL, I was fourteen. And so I had very little understanding or exposure to, to real challenges so far. I was very fortunate in the sense that everything that I worked for up until that point, I managed to achieve. And so this was my first real challenge. Um, and I don't think anyone's prepared to deal with an injury like that. 
Um, but I was very fortunate that I was surrounded by a very good team of physios. I had an extremely good surgeon. I had a lot of great support at the time from, from coaches, from family, from friends. And I think that I had that enthusiasm and, and that, that fire never really burnt out in me at that point. And so I just viewed it as a hurdle. And I think like anything that happens in life or any sort of big injury, you just treat it exactly how you would treat it if you hadn't got injured. So as, as a basketball player, you're thinking when you're working out, okay, what do I need to improve? What's my objective like with this workout? And, and you know, in six weeks time, where do I want to be based on this training regime? And it's exactly, that's exactly how I treated my rehabilitation was, okay, in, in two weeks, I want to be able to achieve X, you know, in three or four months, I want to be able to do straight line running. And so I just tried to refocus my energy into the rehabilitation and getting back on the court. And so all of the energy that I would have had at the time and put into basketball was put into to my physio program and to really being committed to, to doing what I needed to do to get back on court. But that's not to say that it wasn't extremely challenging. I, I took a lot from basketball at the time. It was, it was like, it was who I was. It's how I define myself as a person. So to be sidelined and to be forced to sit out was an extremely challenging thing especially at the age that I was, but I knew that I still had that American dream and that understanding that I wanted to go and pursue a scholarship in America. So I did what I did to, to need to get through that. And then the second one. And the second time, I think it was less difficult for me because I had that experience. Like, you know, that you can come out the other side and get back playing again. And you also have the benefit of knowing exactly what you need to do. And some of the perhaps potholes that I fell down with the first um, surgery and the rehabilitation and coming back. And I knew ahead of time that I needed to, to take care of certain things early. So I would say that the second injury, although disappointing, I think it was easier for me to get through it because I had the knowledge that I've done it before. And I also think that you're more aware the more that you you sort of go through your career that actually like tearing your ACL is unfortunately very common among female athletes and, and professional athletes and also male athletes, but it's more common among um, female athletes. But a lot of people do come back and they bounce back and um, okay, you know, if you listen to the statistics, you're only ever going to be as 80% as, as strong as you were before with that knee or that leg. But I think what you can, what you miss in strength, you can make up in the mental resilience that you get through going through that kind of challenge. Well, well, look, I, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's interesting that you say, I, I just did what anybody else would do, or I just did what you would, you know, what I did, you know, the energy that I didn't have, wasn't able to put in basketball, I just put in my rehab. Um, I think you make some assumptions that everybody can do that. And you know, unfortunately, not everybody can. You're right to say that the, there are lots of people who do come back from tough injuries. But again, I never take that for granted. I think it takes a special kind of person in a in the right environment to come back from even one significant injury, not less two. So, you know, I think... Um, you're probably underselling yourself a little bit, but I think it's fantastic that not only have you come back, but you're still as passionate about basketball. Um, m maybe the priorities are, are different these days, but still, still in the game and still, you know, helping promote the game in the UK. I think that's really big. Um, now, I, I did mention this to you before the show started, that actually you were part of the inspiration for this four-week um, kind of segment that we're having on on player coach um, communication and player coach relationships, um, and and that started after uh, one of my previous guests, Flo Ward, who's also a, a player of mine and, and and was also part of that that under England uh, under eighteen team, um, said, "Look, you've got to read Nina's blog. Like she's written this really cool thing, and you know." Um, you know, it really resonates with some of her experiences and, you know, other 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 girls that have travelled from the UK and have gone to the States. Um, so I started reading it and I was like, yeah, definitely got to get Nina on the show. 
Um, so when I think back to um, your early coach player relationships, I'm reminded of Steve Pearl and, you know, I want you mm-hmm. to tell me, I want you to talk about Steve because, you know, Steve's somebody that if anybody who ever coached against Steve will know that he's one of the most fiery, ferocious, um, seemingly always angry people. And I know that that's not a fair kind of reflection of who he is as a person and, and what he did for you. And I remember us actually having a conversation about what Steve Pearl's like as a, as a person. But tell, tell me about that early kind of coach player re- relationship that you had with Steve. I think that it's interesting that how you describe him and it's not uncommon that a lot, I've had that feedback from a lot of people. Um, if you look at the situation from the outside in, he appears to be extremely tough, um, extremely uh, sort of, he, he values discipline and he can come across like, I think misunderstood is the best way to, to capture Steve. And in fact, my experience with him as a youth, and don't get me wrong, we definitely clashed heads at times. And I definitely felt like, he crossed the line in certain situations or certain games and, and but I think it only helped to build my own mental toughness and I think when you know that a coach deep down has your best interests at heart and you know maybe there was a tough game and you, you know you lost by two and you took the last shot and you didn't make it he's going to be the first person that's going to call you that evening after the dust has settled to make sure that you're okay and throughout my entire experience in the US Steve was the one person that was would always touch base with me would always understand after every game how I was feeling whether it was was great or not great at the time and so I think if you can understand a coach's intention then you can understand that how they deliver that is less important um obviously you know it's a two-way relationship and I think sometimes people and athletes are afraid to sort of feedback to their coach and say like look I'm not understanding you know why did you say that in that situation or what do you, what are you expecting of me in this in this scenario because I feel like I'm doing the right thing but you're you're saying you're not and Steve Steve would always be someone that would be willing to to work on you work with you on an individual basis and yes he came across as very abrupt sometimes and he was very tough but I think that's what gave me the edge that was necessary to be competitive you know, he he taught me from a young age that we would do mixed practices on a Thursday night and he would have me mark the best guy in the gym at the time. And, you know, a lot of coaches will, you know, if you're playing against guys will say, OK, like, you know, if you're playing against Christina, you, you play without your arms or if you're playing, um, don't don't beat them in this way because and and he was like, no, beat her, beat her 10 times over because the 11th time she'll learn how to contain you. And so I think he he did a lot for me and he did a lot for a lot of people at south end and it's a shame that the club no longer exists but um he definitely i would say gave me the mental toughness at a very very young age to to want to continue to be competitive and to want to continue to fight despite any circumstance that you're put in well uh, well look i mean i i am um, i definitely got a, a little bit of an inkling of you know what what it was like to be on the inside of that situation rather than what was on the outside. And if there's anybody that embodies um, the the phrase, listen to the lyrics, not the music, the music was the way that, you know, uh, maybe Steve kind of communicated on the court is very loud, very intense, very forceful, but the lyrics, Mm -hmm. you know, the, what, the, what he was saying, obviously, um, you know, he, he did a lot of good coaching, you know, he developed lots of kids out of that program, some of which um, went on to national teams, some of which went on to go to the States. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, tip my hat to, to Steve. It is a shame that he's, that the club is not, is no longer, in, uh, is no longer running, but clearly there was a period of time where that was one of the, the, the premium junior clubs in the country. And yeah, you know, some Absolutely. of, some of your, some of your experiences are a testament to the work that was done there. Um, so last week we had um, we had um, Harriet Wellam on, and she talked a little bit about how um, she was the maturity, and she now reflects back and says that even where there were coaches that at the time she didn't really get on with, she now re- 
ref- looks back and she knows that she learned something from every coach that she was ever coached by. D- does that resonate with you at all? Can you look back and say, well, you know, I had, you know, you mentioned Karen Burton before I mentioned Michael Ball and, you know, then there was your, your collegiate coach. And since you've been back, you've been, you know, you've played in Europe, you've played um, in the UK. Can you maybe share some of those experiences in terms of how did those early experiences prepare you for the next coach and the next coach and maybe a, a little bit of what you learned from those those people? Yeah, I think that when you're younger, your understanding of the relationship you have with your coach is very different to as you become, I guess, quote unquote, a professional. And so when you're younger, you just, you listen to what you, is, is told of you and um, that's it. There is no interpretation or um, miscommunication. And you're a bit naive to understanding what makes a good coach, like, you know, or, you know, should should the coach be be talking to me in this way? Because in your mind, there there's a hierarchy and the coach is here and, and you're here and your responsibility is, is to listen and to, to complete your role or, or job as, as best as possible. But I think, as you become or as you advance through the game and you get a little bit older you start to learn a little bit more about the game yourself and so how your coach tends to evolve um or at least i believe that it should and i think that as a player you should be incorporated a little bit more into understanding exactly why you're putting a certain system into place or why um you're running uh, particular plays or just generally your understanding of, of decisions that are being made, because I think for some athletes and, and myself included, it's important to understand why we're doing something to understand, you know, how to do it. So that if a scenario changes in a game, you understand that, okay, this was the basis of, of why you made that decision. And so we've come across this sort of unique circumstance, but I understand why you've made that decision and therefore I can like respond accordingly. Um, and I think that's just something that changes as, as your basketball IQ changes. But in terms of um, my level of preparedness, as, as I've gone through my sort of various hurdles in my professional career, would I say that I've, I've taken something from every coach that I've been coached by? Absolutely. But I don't think that all of those things were positive things. I think some of my relationships and, and my collegiate relationship in particular most of the things that I learned from her is how not to be a leader and how not to treat people. And I don't have any qualms in saying that. And I think sometimes that's what you get from relationships that you have with people is, is you learn how you don't want to be. And if you're ever in a position where you're a manager or a leader or someone that um, is in, in a powerful position, I don't want to, someone to feel like I was made to feel in that scenario. And, and that's okay too. And I think it's great that, that, Harriet last week touched on the fact that yes you should learn something from every every person in the same way you should learn something from every situation in life and if that's how not to be or um how not to act then that's that's worthwhile as well and sometimes it's hard to understand that at the time but I absolutely you know I'm I'm very privileged in the sense that now um being at Riders I've I've probably at the sort of later end of my career and moving on to what will will be in my professional life soon and i've i've literally hit the sweet spot with the coach that i have right now he understands um basketball to a very high level he's tactically and technically extremely smart but he also understands how to communicate and and talk to players and to have that coach player relationship that i think is is so necessary and sometimes overlooked and i think at different points in my career so far i've had i've had some people that have managed to to have both like yourself but i've also had a lot of coaches that are either one or the other they're either extremely good technically or tactically or they're really good at the the coach and player relationship part but ha- perhaps like the technical tactical side they still need to you know move forward and so i'm very grateful with jesper at the, at the riders right now that we've um, and and we regularly talk about it as the players on the team that I think some of the younger players have no idea how fortunate they are to to have a coach like him. So I'm very, very grateful for the current situation that I'm in. Hey, well, look, I, I'm, I'm really happy for you as well, particularly, you know, I, I was saying that I, you know, I'd started reading, I started reading your blog about six weeks ago and, and the last kind of week or so I've dipped in and out of it again. And I was reading it for a couple of hours 
this afternoon and, and given the experience and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on tonight's show um, for anybody who wants to kind of reflect on, you know, or, 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 or look in more detail at what Christina went through when she was kind of in New York, um, the blog's there and it's a lot easier to read that and, and get a sense of, you know, um, the, the absolute highs and, well, there weren't that many highs by the by the sounds of it. I mean, I'm guessing there were some things you didn't talk about that in terms of the relationships of players and, and the support that you eventually found, you know, to get yourself out of that situation. But yeah, for anybody who's listening tonight, please check out N Nina's blog. It's not it's not all about it's not all about sad times and and depression, but it's about there are some very um, very hard to read experiences in there, but I think you know. I think you were saying that over twenty five thousand people globally have actually tapped in and and checked out the blog, and you know that's a testament to how honest and open you're willing to be about what is often a very difficult situation to kind of reflect on. I, I want to talk. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know how do you. How do you now, or, or, or at what point, and this is something you do touch upon in the blog, you know, you talk a little bit about how you, a lot of your self-expression, a lot of your confidence was expressed on a basketball court. I think you talk about, you know, right. you, you starting off as quite a, a shy person. Um, you even, you know, even tonight you talked about, you know, not being the best player and, you know, at, at times describing yourself as a bit clumsy, but actually, when you got on the basketball court, you were you felt like you could express yourself, and um, and I I got the sense reading kind of reading your blog that you use basketball almost as a way to define yourself, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be alone in that. There's a lot of people, coaches and players alike, who define themselves by their jobs and by their passions, and when that doesn't work, when that's not working so well, that can have a massive impact on you as a person and on your mental health and on your happiness right. and your growth um at what stage was it for you that you started to realize that there is a nina that isn't just a basketball player and there is not not that there's just more to basketball but basketball is one part of who you are and how you express yourself and actually there's so much more of you as a person and you know, we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing next and, you know, your research and stuff. But what what point was that for you? I think um, I think a real big tipping point for me was after I tore my ACL the second time and I started to realise that, you know, actually everything can change very quickly. And so putting all of my eggs in, into basketball um, may not be strategically the best decision for me. Um, but it was still very difficult for me to accept or understand who I was beyond Christina, the basketball player, like you said. And I think going into my senior year in, in college and obviously, you know, going through the experiences that I did and, and some of the things that I touch on in, in the blog, I was almost forced to understand who I was beyond um, an athlete and beyond a basketball player. And I think up until that point, you almost feel as though you're doing yourself a disservice if you commit or enjoy anything in life other than the things that are directly going to improve you as a player and so whether that be you know I took everything extremely seriously I I was an elite athlete by every definition and I would like to say that I still am but I allow you know certain other pleasures that I perhaps thought were you know not permitted at that time so you know whether it was nutrition in college or whether it was being extremely um disciplined about my the physio situation and, and lifting like every single thing that I did I was extremely competitive in and I think when you put that much emotional time and commitment into being successful and you you don't achieve the outcome that you want to achieve and coupled with the fact that you believe that's who you are as a person and that is the sole sort of piece of your identity then you, you're forced into almost like an identity crisis because everything that you you've thought you knew about yourself and everything that defined you and everything that was positive about who you are and 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 even to to the extent that every every person that sort of touched base with you when, when you're in america says like oh hey how you doing how's the basketball going like it was it was always like the first question people asked and so 
very uh, few people said, hey, Christina, how are you? It was, you know, how's how's the basketball going? Like, how are your stats at the moment? Like, are you playing? Like, how's the league? How's the season going? Um, and so it, it reinforces that that's who you are as a person. So it's extremely difficult to separate yourself from that. And not to say that I wasn't focused academically and not to say that I didn't, I wasn't interested in business. I was very interested in business and entrepreneurship, but I didn't understand how to to be okay taking a step away from basketball and finding enjoyment and satisfaction in other things. And I think that it got to the point where my my hand was forced, where I became so depleted emotionally and physically that I needed to do something for myself to understand, you know, what is the next steps in my life and 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 what are the other positive attributes of myself as a human being beyond just Christina the athlete. And so I I guess that that um journey began in my senior year of college and it still continues to this day it's it's very difficult and it's something that I still talk about with a lot of other professional athletes is you need to be able to compartmentalize you need you need to be able to take time away from from sport after a bad game or a bad practice or even a bad season and realize okay I had a situation or a bad season or a bad game but that doesn't make me a bad individual or like that shouldn't define who I am and uh, and my character. Um, I'm more than that. And I think when you can actually learn to do that, you actually learn to relax a lot more on the court and put less pressure on yourself. And you're able to to see things for what they really are. Um, which you know, as as silly as it sounds, and I'm very grateful for everything that basketball has afforded me. It is just a game. And so, um, I think you really have to to take to, sometimes you have to take a step away to to really like the full picture of everything okay so you know let's kind of almost rewind to go forwards so you senior year you had you know i guess you were at the at the lowest point in in that kind of journey and and to, to the point that you ended up not not finishing as a, as a collegiate athlete finishing your degree right. but not finishing on the on the team and you know that's you know i i i I'd ha- actually not appreciated that that's what had happened. You know, I'd kind of followed your journey in in and out, and then, um, you know, you get to that you get to that point, and you start to have to, like you say, your you, you, your hand was forced, and you get to a point where you have to start redefining who you are as a person, not just Christina the athlete, Christina the basketball player, and you're almost at a point where nobody would have been surprised if you just decided to walk away from the game at that point um so so what did it take for you then to come to to leave to leave new york and then decide that you're still going to go and play another season you're going to go and play in italy how do you how do you make that transition while you're trying to get the balance of you know it's just a game basketball isn't me you know I'm more than basketball how does that fit in where where did that where did that come from I think that um it's always extremely difficult to to finish something on on a bad note I think as human beings we naturally try and seek out closure in a lot of situations and so I think closure for a lot of people is is finishing on on a positive note and so I kind of buried the idea that I was a basketball player. And um, upon graduating, I I worked in New York for about 18 months. And I don't even think I picked up a basketball during that time. And that was the the break that I think I needed. But by the time I returned to the UK, I realized that, that the flame that like never really went out, it just was dulled a little bit through my experiences in college. I I just had this like, itch that I wanted to I wanted to get back to it in some capacity and I guess it was kind of happenstance that obviously for one that I I was able to to work and play in London at the time but also for two that um my current agent happened to to see one of my games and contacted me via Facebook and said look have you ever thought about playing basketball professionally and honestly my goals for basketball and for my career ended at the point in which I arrived in New York as a freshman. That was like my my ceiling in terms of what I wanted to achieve or what I sort of had laid out for myself. So 
playing professionally and having a career after college was something I'd never really thought um, was achievable or I never really, you know, spent that much time thinking about. And so obviously after having conversations with him, I'm sort of of the understanding or I have, and maybe this is a slightly uh, toxic characteristic, but I like to say in life that I've tried something and gone and done something. And if it doesn't work out, then we can pick up the pieces and, and work, uh, you know, work forward from there. Then in five years, sort of look back and say, OK, well, what if I had have done that? What if I had have taken that opportunity or, you know, what could have that have been like? And and so I did. I got a contract to, to play basketball in Italy and I had a, an amazing sort of year, year and a half. I met some amazing people and I reignited my love for the game completely. And and it and it was it was an interesting contrast because i always thought that playing professionally would be they would demand a lot more of you than than college but in fact playing professionally like wasn't as hard as playing college basketball in america and it wasn't because of the physical demands but it was because like of the mental um i think side of things and the expectations that they had of you um when you're a professional you're expected to turn up and they trust what you can do and they've, they've bought into the idea of who you are as as an athlete and they're they're paying you for that very reason so it's it's a completely different environment and i think it was one that i i thoroughly enjoyed and i'm extremely grateful that i did make the decision to to not completely um give up on the game and to sort of now be slowly winding down in a capacity that feels um, healthy and it feels though as though in, in 10 years time I can look back and say like I turned things around and I didn't finish on a bad note. Excellent well look you you also um you know as part of that transition you also talked about you know some of the challenges that um l let's call them semi semi pro athletes that still they're still professional athletes they're still you know either playing for professional teams or they're being paid to play, but are also trying to hold down kind of jobs. And, you know, you, you talked about, um, I'm referring to your, uh, to something I read in your blog today, where you talk about actually realizing that being a professional athlete gave you some, some opportunities or gave you the time to reflect on the fact that you didn't have to do a job that you, hated going to in the morning and resented at the end of the day and that actually you could right. do something that you that you loved but you could also start to create something and you know and we, you've you've mentioned a couple of times about just starting to understand the, the points at which you started to understand about kind of entrepreneurial life and opportunities um so so how how has that kind of evolved for you and and what are you doing now you know what does that entrepreneurial kind of aspect of your of your life look like so i think i made a I, well i know that i made an assurance and a promise to myself that when i was um going through what i went through in college and at the point in which i decided to walk away from the team with the support and help from a lot of other people I made the commitment to myself that I would never put myself in a situation again that I was unhappy in and I would always make an active choice to move towards things that I enjoy and that bring happiness into my life at whatever um, difficulty that may bring I'm always going to push for that for myself um, where possible and so I think it, it's not easy I think that as an athlete you're given a lot of the soft um, attributes and characteristics that are beneficial to being an entrepreneur and to to trying different ventures and to taking risks I think these are all um attributes that you learn from from being an athlete and so almost we're given the um I guess platform to to have a head start in that area but in terms of how has basketball helped me with with those connections I think just in terms of playing in a lot of different places, meeting a lot of different people from a lot of different circumstances and walks of life, whether that's um, in terms of like their background, what they've been through or where they're from um, or their experiences in the world, it allows you to, to have a very broad network. So from my experiences, um, I've been able to, to network and meet with a lot of different people that have allowed me to build a consulting business. So, off the back of working in New York after I finished college, 
and keeping and maintaining those connections, I still am able to consult um, within real estate um, in America. So I have clients in that um, area of the world, but I also have connections that I made when I was playing professionally in Italy. And I actually help out um, a woman there who's just wrote a book on basketball nutrition. And I helped out her to do the social media and to really grow her platform because she wants to eventually translate the book into English. So there's a lot of different um, opportunities that come up from from being an athlete and being in different environments and being willing to to meet different people and to really learn about you know what are other people trying to do and to be open to to taking a risk and taking a chance i don't think it's for the entrepreneurial lifestyle um it's for people that crave stability or to crave consistency because it's very up and down i've moved a lot like i've but I think that's one of the things that I enjoy about life is the opportunity to meet a lot of different people and to, to live in different places and experience different cultures and understand how different people around the world um, to go through life. I think that there's no greater pleasure than that. So um, I think it aligns very well with myself as, as an individual, but it's definitely not for everyone. Well, look, I, I think um, you, you, you will definitely inspire, you know, quite a few people, particularly kind of basketball people who um, recognise that actually what they enjoy about, partly about the game is that opportunity to, you know, immerse yourself in different cultures and travel and, and do all those things and take risks. I mean, you know, you can't be a good athlete if you're not willing to do that. And, you know, maybe get, you know, maybe a few more people will realise that, you know, rather than feeling like you've got to try and manage a nine to five job uh, in something that you, and, and that's not to say that everybody who does a nine to five job is necessarily unpassionate or doesn't like what they do, because clearly that's not the case, but that sense right. of, um, you know, being willing to, to take some chances. And, and I think we've, we've never lived in a better time to just go and create something and make a living out of doing that and providing you're, you know, you, you can get through the early years of, of it not, not being the most stable way to earn a, earn a living, actually in terms of following your passion and following your dreams and, and being creative, that's something that, you know, a lot of professional athletes are, are doing as well. I mean, I think, you know, that's not, that's not new, that, that's something that a lot, a lot more people are understanding that they are their own brand and the, the growth right. of social media has allowed people to express themselves and, and create projects that can be monetized and and that they can right. hopefully make a very successful living from. So I'm really pleased to hear um, that bit of your story as well. That's not that's not necessarily in in the blog. So it's useful that we're having a a, a conversation about kind of where you're going and, and what's next. Um, look, I, I've taken up quite a lot of your time, and mm. um, I hope that this for us is a a kind of um, a reigniting of a, of a relationship that started a long time ago. Um, but Absolutely. I'd just like to, fin to finish on, you know, you mentioned again, pre-show, you mentioned that you're doing, you know, you're doing your, your masters, um, you're doing some work with basketball England about the experiences of, of players going out to the States. And for me, that's kind of a nice full circle in terms of reflecting on, you know, the kind of player coach experience and player coach communication. Could you just tell me a little bit about that research and what, you know, what, what is the intention? What, what, what's going to happen with it? For sure. So obviously it's no secret that I didn't have a, a particularly positive experience overall. There were highlights and there were, you know, wonderful parts of my college career, but I think after receiving the feedback that I did and with the amount of people that it reached and, you know, complete strangers are messaging me saying, you know, I'm so glad that you, that you've written this. And I'm so glad that you're sharing the, the truth of certain situations because I also went through this as well. I felt compelled to try and help and make a difference with younger athletes, particularly in this country, in their decision-making process and the next steps that they're trying to take in their career and creating some kind of resource or support for them so that there was a better chance that they had a positive experience. And the only way that I felt like I could do that most impactfully is 
by doing research because obviously I can sit here and say, okay, well, I didn't have a great experience and all these people are messaging me and saying that they, they felt the same way, but that wouldn't be truly objective. And I know that there are people that, that make the decision to go to America and they have a wonderful career and wonderful experience and they go on to play professionally or they go on to, to complete a, um, a master's or to play in a different country or to, to move on to a professional job. But having had a wonderful experience and I want to understand, OK, well, what's the difference? Like, how come some people make the decision to go and seem to have a great time or a great experience that propels them into the second part of their career and other people go and struggle like I did um, and don't have a, a positive experience? And so the idea of the research is to tease out some of the details and, you know, really get into the depths of of people's experiences and stories and understand whether there is any kind of correlation among um, certain people versus others. And is there, you know, something that we can provide as a federation to help people make better decisions, to support them better when they're out there, to make the the bridge or connection between when they, when that perhaps that communication or that situation does break down. Um, and I think, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about, just knowing that the mental state that I got to when I was in America, I, I want to ensure that if I can, no one else has to go through that where possible. And so right now we're, we're doing the research to understand the reality of the situation. And then off the back of that, we will hopefully be able to create um, resource and support around um, that transition for elite athletes in this country. Excellent. Well, look, I'm... I look forward to, to to reading that piece of work in whatever in whatever format it ends up being produced in. You know anything that can help athletes um, at least prepare for the journey and prepare for the fact that it doesn't always go well. But um, as you reflected on this evening, you know you can learn even from a difficult situation. What we don't want to do is we we want people to avoid those really bad situations. Those um, you know those, those those situations that can be avoided and 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 right. hopefully impact empower those athletes not to accept that just because it, you're told it's going to be hard there's a difference mm -hmm. between it being hard and it being shit and it being crap right. and you you know you right. you know you you actually getting to a point where you're questioning whether you're in the right situation or whether you were good enough to go there in the first place this is all stuff that i know that you've reflected right. on um and I, i'm going to end the show with with a, a a phrase that i read from your blog today um which is you know you've learned throughout life and, and correct me if i get this wrong that there are three types of people there are nice people <laughs> who do good things there are uh, nice people that do bad things and there are bad people that do bad things it's something along those lines and um, that Correct. was the that that was the takeaway from uh, reading a lot of different things. Um, I think that summarizes, you know, um, a lot of a lot of situations. You know, some some experiences you 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 go through. There are organizational systematic reasons why they don't work, and absolutely, right. we you know organizations whether it's, whether it's the colleges, whether it's the NCAA, whether it's basketball England. They have a responsibility to make sure that those systematic um, issues are challenged. But some of it does come down to meeting the wrong person or even a well-intentioned person who does the wrong thing. And again, the ability to recognize that can be the difference between feeling like it's all your fault and recognizing that actually something needs to change, whether it's behavior, whether it's values, whether it's character. Um, and I'm just really grateful that you've put yourself in a situation where you could look back and reflect on those situations and take the positives out of that situation in their actions and, and the value that they placed on other human beings. Um, but Nina, I thank you so much for taking the time to join us kind of this evening. And again, be super honest and be very candid and share those experiences. And I look forward to kind of staying in contact with contact with you even if initially it's just over um social media and you know i i, fo I follow you on instagram um I'm, I'm glad that you that you occasionally kind of check in on me as well which is really nice to nice that that relationship has kind of continued over those years 
No, absolutely. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to, to speak to you tonight. And I'm looking forward to, to watching your progress as well as a coach and as someone that, you know, has always and, and will continue to always care about athletes and put them first. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nina. Thank you, everybody that uh, tuned in tonight. If you didn't get it tonight or you know that there's somebody else that wants to watch the show, they can always watch our kind of catch up version, um, which has lots of pictures and videos of the athletes, you know, kind of reminiscing and talking about their experiences. Um, we thank you so much for supporting us and we hope you'll continue to, to tune in every Wednesday at 7.15, roughly for 30 minutes. But, you know, you know, I, I normally invite other talkers. It never really lasts 30 minutes. Thank you so much. Have a great evening and speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.